Well, good morning, brothers and sisters, and welcome again. Uh, still in our lockdown, but I must say God is good. We are serving a God who is risen and a God who cares for each one of us. As we think about what we're going through, we can only ask God to help us to build our faith. Uh, I hear a lot of things of people saying the new normal, a new world. Are we going to go back to the old way? Well, we don't know. And in effect, we can't change things that we haven't got control over. But what we can do is we can hold on to the hope and the glory, which is Jesus Christ. Now, I want to continue today as we follow Jesus through the book of Mark and as he is teaching us about faith, as our faith is growing. Every single time we see Jesus operating with people, our faith is growing. And we're going to see that again today. Last week we saw that Jesus multiplied the bread and the fish and he was feeding a crowd of 5,000 <clears throat> plus. Now, that is a wonderful miracle. If you think about it, he took bread. It is the daily necessities that we need. He took that and he touched that. And for you and for me, it shows that God will provide to his children. But that is not why we serve him. That is not why we follow him. It's not what God can do for us or what Jesus can do for us. It is our worship towards him for who he is. He is a holy God. So we saw Jesus doing this. He took his disciples. He was going to take them away. Remember, prior to that, they went out two by two and they must have been tired. The Bible says they went in without food. He took them to a deserted place. The crowds followed them there and then the miracle happened. And we learn more about Jesus' compassion in that passage. And now we take the next step. We follow Jesus as he continues further with his disciple. Just as a side note, I want to remind you that Mark, who is the writer of this gospel, is sitting at the feet of Peter and hearing from Peter the account that Peter had with Jesus and he relays it and we're going to see it evidently in the passage today. So my prayer is that God will speak to you through this passage in your own circumstance where you are. Know this that God sees you to, today. Know this that God knows about you. He's omniscient. He knows every single thing. Nothing is hidden from him. So let us pick up this morning in Mark chapter 6. And we're going to read now from verse 45. The word of God says immediately. And this is, as you recall, uh, our friend Mark, when he writes everything, he's a young man and he's a fast paced writer and he loves to use this word immediately. It's an action packed book. He says immediately he made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side, to Bethsaida. While he sent the multitude away, and when he had sent them away, he departed to the mountain to pray. Now let's just pause there for a moment and see what is happening in this passage. The meaning for Bethsaida is the house of light. And he sends his disciples now immediately. Jesus takes his disciples away from the crowd. He puts them in the boat. Now you've got to remember what time of the day it is. This time of the day, they've had their dinner, afternoon dinner. Jesus did the wonderful miracle. In verse 35, he says that the day was far spent already. And now as they come in to the night time, Jesus pulls them away from the crowd. And he puts them into the boat to go to the other side, to go to Bethsaida. So they are going through the night again on that same sea. I want you to recall what happened before. Not so many moons before this. Jesus was with them also at nighttime, 
on the same lake, on the same sea, when there was a wind blowing and he was fast asleep on the boat. Now he sends them away without him on the boat. He wasn't even there on the boat. But I want you to see the fine line here, the underlining picture here that's happening. The name of Bethsaida means house of light. They go into the darkness to get to the house of light. And so many times we go through dark times in our lives where we can't see the light or maybe the light is afar off. But these men had to go through this darkness, this dark time in their lives to get to the house of light, Bethsaida. Now, you and I know that if you travel by night and you see a light in a distance, it means there is life. Somebody had to turn the light on. And we know that Jesus Christ is our life. And though you might go through a dark time in your life, there is light on the other side. And I just found it so fascinating when I looked at the meaning of the name Bethsaida. I, would, I wonder how this conversation would have gone between the disciples and this Jesus for them to get onto the boat. Uh, Jesus, can't you remember last time, just, just you know, not a, a long time ago, we went through the same experience and now you send us away. But you see, they do it on his word anyway. They get into the boat and they go out onto the sea. We will see that this is a test of their faith. And remember, if faith is not tested, it is not faith. And these men, now they go out and what does Jesus do? He sends the crowd away and then he goes up onto the mountain to pray. To be on his own with the Father. And this is important for us to do. I've touched on it last week and I want to mention it again. It is to pull away. This, this must have been a fantastic high for Jesus and for the disciples and for the people around him to see how he miraculously made that food multiply and multiply. And this is now the high point. And remember what I said a few weeks ago. It is when you had your biggest victory that you are at your most vulnerable because you come from a high and if you go into that stage of of relaxation that is when the enemy can attack you and this is why it's important for us to to come to god and to spend time with him from our victories and also from the valleys in our lives so he pulls away he goes to the mountain and then he prays to the father now let's continue in the narrative in verse 47 now, when evening came, the boat was in the middle of the sea and he was alone on land. Then he saw them straining at rowing for the wind was against them. Now, about the fourth watch by night, he came to them walking on the sea and would have passed them by. This is one of the most fascinating and mind boggling, if you want to use that word, miracles that happened that a man he was in his 30s that a man would be able to walk on water on liquid and even today there is so many false uh, uh, people who wants to try to do this and if you can do this and walk on water people would would have a lot of faith in you this was not Jesus's agenda no we will see what his agenda was and why he did that. But here we see that he walks on the water. What a miracle. Again, it shows us who Jesus is. He was God with us. Man just like us. And in this particular moment, he chose to walk and to defy gravity to pull him into the water. So it says that it was in the night time and these people were in the middle of the sea. Now, it must have been supernatural knowledge for Jesus to have. He was high on the mountain looking out at, at night time over the sea. Now, it doesn't say there was a storm of rain or clouds or anything like that. So most probably there could have been a moon that, that, that was shining very bright at night and he could see in a distance, maybe, he could see in a distance, he could see them struggling. I don't know. It doesn't matter. But the Bible says that he saw them in the dark. But what 
really hit me about this passage is that he saw them straining at rowing for the wind was against them. My brother and sister, dear friend, how many times do you find in life the wind against you? It feels as if you make one step progress and go two steps back in life. This happens and I want to do a, a spiritual application to this here. The Greek word for that word straining or rowing against the, the wave is where we find our English word torture from. And we all know what torture is. These men are there. They are rowing against the wind. It, it burns on their muscles. The wind's howling. It is blowing water into the boat. It feels as if, you know, they are struggling, rowing. They can't get anywhere in life. And maybe you feel like that. Maybe during this time where you're secluded from people, you feel like that. And I, I must mention it to you here that there is, a, there is a lot of impact on people during this time being isolated socially from other people. And maybe you're in that situation. Just know this. Know this that Jesus is looking. If he could look at nighttime, get this, over the sea, and I don't know about you, I've been in the middle of an ocean at night time. There is nothing that you can see on the water at night. Believe me, it is, even, even on the times that I was in the middle of the ocean and the moon is up, you can only see a, a shorter distance than you can by day where, where the moon is reflecting off the water. But he saw them at night time in the middle of the ocean, in the middle of the sea of Galilee, straining against the wind. Know this, take heart today, that He knows where you are. He sees exactly where you are. He sees your torture you're going through. He knows about the, the, the wind that's blowing against you. And this is the fascinating thing for me about it, is that He knows that, and He is the master of the wind and the sea. We saw that a few chapters before. He was sleeping on the boat. And when he stood up, he rebuked the wind and he calmed the waters. So I don't know where you are in your life. I don't know what you're going through. But I want to speak to you personally. Because I believe the word of God is speaking to you. He saw them straining and rowing and pushing against that wind. Now the Bible says it was in the fourth watch, which was between three and six in the morning. Now get this. I, I want you to, to understand the whole picture. That when they left on the boat, it was fair weather. When Jesus put them on the boat to go over to Bethsaida into the night, it was still early. Let's call it 9 o'clock, 9 p.m. if the sun takes long to go under. So if he came to them in the fourth watch, 3 a.m. in the morning, it means that they've been struggling for six hours already to get to the other side and they only... They only managed to get halfway through. This is a lot of hard work to come to this point. So I want you to take heart and to know that Jesus understands your situation. He knows exactly where you are. He allowed this miracle to happen so that your faith could be built and could be built up with him. And then the word says that he came to them walking on the sea. Walking on the sea. And we're going to see the reaction of these boys in a minute. But I want to think of these boys. They are Jewish boys on that boat, rowing away. And they must have read to Job. They must have, uh, when they came and grew up to the age of 12 years old, must have heard when the rabbi would have read to them in the synagogue the account of Job. And there are beautiful passages in Job that talks about God walking on the water. He talks about that. For instance, Job 9, 7. He commands the sun and it does not rise. He seals the stars. He alone spreads out heaven and treads on the waves of the sea. Job 9, 7. This is talking about God. Job speaking about God. And how powerful he is, omnipotent he is. 
uh, and he says that this God that we serve, and I want you to know this this morning, that the God that you are serving is this God that he's talking about. And he's real to me as, as you are real to me, as, as you know, these clothes is real to me. And so real was he to Job. When Job says, he commands the sun and he does not rise. He seals the stars and alone spreads out the heavens and treads on the waves of the sea. So these Jewish boys heard that when they grew up. Job 38, 16. Have you entered the springs of the sea? Question mark, or have you walked in search of the depths of the sea? So these are passages talking about God walking on the water. And I... I just think that they must have thought as young boys, yeah, surely God is spirit. That's what they were they, they, they were taught. And he must have been flying like a bird over the waters. Never in their lives, never would have thought that they would physically see Jesus, God with us, doing what Job was talking about here. Uh, and the psalmist write about in seven, uh, Psalm 77, 19, your way was in the sea, your path in the great waters, and your footsteps were not known. It was not known. How wonderful for these young boys to would have heard that and learned that. And now in the next moment that's going to happen in this middle of the storm, straining and torturing away against the wind, which is against them. Something which they've learned from their younger years is now going to happen to them. The privilege they had, the privilege to not only hear it, but seeing it, seeing and, and, and confining those scriptures towards this. Now, the word there says that he walked and he would have passed them by. I just want to uh, stop for a minute there. It doesn't mean that Jesus lost them doesn't mean that. There is a purpose in this. He saw the boat on the water. And also, it just come up in my mind now that it wasn't only 10 meters he walked on the water. He walked all the way from the side of the sea to the middle of the sea on the water towards them. Help is on its way. So the Bible says he could have walked them past. Now, I want you now to look at these Jewish boys in that boat and imagine that sitting there and straining away and starting to fear about drowning, fearing that eventually now it's going to happen, which didn't happen a few you know, weeks ago. Um, Jesus is not in the boat. They can't call on Jesus anymore. They can't. But they keep on stride, you know, straining against this. What's their reaction now? Watch it now. Jesus walks and he would have walked him past. Verse 49. And when they saw him walking on the sea, they supposed it was a ghost and cried out for they all saw him and were troubled. But immediately he talked with them and said, be of good cheer. It is I do not be afraid. Then he went up into the boat with them and the wind ceased and they were greatly amazed in themselves beyond measure and marveled for they had not understood the loaves because their hearts were hardened. Really interesting how we were talking about the sea now. Jesus walks on the water, but he brings back the loaves. So they were still contemplating about the loaves. How could this be? How could this be? They were still marveling about this, but their hearts were still hardened. You see, that makes the point that a lot of people is looking to Jesus for the miracles he's doing, not for who he is. He's God with us. And it's the same that happened to these little Jewish boys. But it's noticeable in this account of Jesus walking on the water that the part where Peter was walking on the water is not in here. And I don't know, I can only speculate and maybe one day we can ask Peter when we're in heaven. But when he tells this account over to young Mark and Mark writes this down, he purposely left out the passage where he was walking on the water. And I want to bring it back to you. I want to read it to you now. Because I think it is important. 
And then we'll come back and unpack a little bit of this passage. And we find it in Matthew 14, 28. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. Remember, they saw him and they were so afraid and they shouted out with fear. The Jews is so afraid of the water and big bodies of water. The Jews be believe that the ocean is chaos and it's hell. That's what the Jews believe. These young Jewish boys would have grown up in that. Yes, they were fishermen. Not all of them, but they were fishermen. They know the ocean. They know how to work on it. But these are surely circumstances which they haven't seen before. They haven't seen a ghost. The, the Greek word there for ghost is phantom. They haven't seen a phantom on the water before. Otherwise, they would have said, yeah, we've seen that, that before. This is the first time. So they, they freak out, okay? They shout, they scream out of fear. The fear now of this phantom on the water now overrides the fear of the wind that's against them. So there's a lot of fear going on and it paralyzes them. And the only thing they can do is shout out with fear. And, and it's then that Jesus said, uh, be of good cheer in his eye. And he got into the boat. But before he got into the boat, this happened. Now, when Jesus said those words, Peter answered him. He says, Lord, if it is you, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. So he said to him, come. And when Peter had come down onto the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. So he did walk on the water. He had enough faith to walk on that water for that first few steps. So it is a miracle that Jesus walked on the water. But also a miracle that Peter when he stepped out of that boat, walked on the water. But, and there's our sharp contrast in verse 30. When he saw the wind was boisterous, he was afraid and beginning to sing, crying out, Lord, save me. And this is what I've been saying now for the last few weeks and months and so on. Fear destroys faith. Listen to me. Listen to me. Fear will destroy your faith. This man was keeping his eyes on Jesus. And it's the moment that he took his eyes away from Jesus and was looking at the boisterous wind that was against them. It is when he saw that fear grabbed hold of him and he started to sink. There is such a, a, a big lesson for us in here. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Keep it on Jesus. All the devil would want you to do is to take your eyes off Jesus and focus on your problem. Focus on your problem is not going to help you. Focus on your problem is going to show you iniquities, uh, inadequacies, that you can't do it. You're going to come to a point and say, I can't, I give up. I give up. And, and, and we see what happens as soon as you take your eyes off Jesus and you look at that and fear grabs all of you, you sink. You sink and you need a savior. Now this happens to him. He says, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus straight out his hand, caught him and said to him, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. And then those who were with the boat came and worshiped him and saying, Truly, you are the son of God. They say the name, the title, Son of God, which means God came down. God reached down from heaven. He uses the title Son of Man, where He reaches up as our intercessor and as our high priest up into heaven. Now, they supposed He was a ghost. So I want to come back to that part there for a minute. And I would too. I would too suppose He was a ghost. If you can only think that He... He, uh, at night time, you know, the wind's blowing, the sea is, the salt sea in your eyes, and maybe the light has gone out, gone, gone out in the boat, and, and maybe the moon is up, and they can see, and see this image coming on the water. I would have freaked out as well. I would have been afraid as well. But you see, the thing is, these men, they, they had this background of God walking on the water, and, uh, the water is up and it's down and they are sore from rowing and torturing against these waves. And now they see this figure uh, walking on the water. So what is an application of this? You know, sometimes Jesus comes to us in ways that we don't expect it. 
They didn't expect Jesus to come in that way. He wasn't with them. And already the fear grabbed their hearts that they were going to die that night. They're going to drown. This thing's going to tip over. They're not going to make it. And then Jesus came in a way where they didn't expect it. It was written. It was written that he would come in that way, but they didn't expect it. And here we find it so beautifully. It is a, it is a wonderful passage for us to look at. And in fact, I was thinking about this. The miracle here is that Jesus defied gravity by not sinking into the water with his body weight. What a wonderful lesson we learn from Jesus. There's another passage in the Bible which I recalled uh, where gravity was defied as well. So, you know, nothing is new under the sun. It's happened before. This time not with a man, but I want to read you the account in um, 2 Kings chapter 6 with one of God's prophets, Elisa. Now, <clears throat> listen to this now. Fascinating. Absolutely fascinating. And the sons of the prophets said to Elisa, See now, a uh, place where we dealt with you is too small for us. Please let us go to the Jordan and let every man take a beam from there and let us make there a place where we may dwell. So he answered to them, go. You know, this is, uh, he's talking here about um, Gehazi's greed and, and these people. They say, well, you know, we want, we want to spread our wings, okay? And he said to them, go. Then one said, please consent to us uh, to go with your servants. And he answered, I will go. So he went with them. And when they came to the Jordan, they cut down trees. But as one was cutting down a tree, the iron axe head fell into the water. And he cried out and said, Alas, master, for it was borrowed. So here is a man. He's with an iron axe. And you and I know that iron is heavy. And he was hitting away on a tree. And as he hit away on the tree, the iron flies off into the water. And you and I know what happens with iron if you throw it into the water. It goes down. Okay? And you have to dive in, try to retrieve it, and, and it's a muddy story. This man cries out immediately to Elias. I say, I've borrowed it. It's not even mine. And see now what happens. So the man of God said, where did it fall? And he showed him to the place. So he cut off a stick and threw it in there and made the iron float. The first ship in the world. I'm just joking. Therefore he said, pick it up with yourself and reach out. And the man reached out with his hand and he took it. So there you find it. So the Bible is full of miracles. But the biggest miracle is that Jesus Christ came and he lived amongst us. And we learn from him and, and he show us that he is master over nature. And again he did. What is that teaching you? What is that giving you today? I believe it should give you hope. I believe it should build your faith. He sees you in your darkest moment. And it might feel torturous to you. And it might feel like the dark of nights. But these men were on their way to Bethsaida, the house of light. What better to get the light of lights getting with them into the boat. I want you to understand that the passage there says that when he got with them into the boat, the wind stopped. That wind was so against them. But when Jesus got with them in the boat, the wind stopped. My friend, dear brother, sister, sir, madam, the lesson here is get Jesus in your boat. Let him go with you wherever you go. Not as a, as a protector. That's not who he is. But as your Lord and as your Savior. He went with them. And this is the account of Jesus walking on the water. I want to finish off Mark chapter 6. And we'll just read through that. And next, uh, next week we'll go to chapter 7. He says in verse 53. When they had crossed over. They came to the land of Gennesareth. And anchored there. And when they came out of the boat. Immediately the people recognized him. This is Jesus. Ran that all the surrounding and regions and began to carry out the beds of those who were sick to wherever they heard he was. Wherever he entered into villages, cities in the country, they laid sick in the marketplaces and begged him that they might touch them, of, uh, uh, might just touch the hem of his garment. 
and as many as touch him were made well. What a wonderful Jesus we serve. He was walking on the water. A wonderful miracle. And this is written in the Bible so that your faith today could be built. May the Lord bless you this week. I will see you again on Wednesday, Thursday for the Bible study video coming out. But take heart today. Take heart that Jesus cares for you. He sees you in the middle of the night. He sees how you are straining and is up against the wind that blows gale force against you. But he will not let you perish. He will come to you in a way that you don't expect it. And when you see him at first of you might be frightened. He might appear like a ghost to you. But he will say these wonderful words to you. Be of good cheer, it is I. Do not be afraid. God bless you. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this word. We thank you for the opportunity, Lord, to have your word and to have this medium that we can still preach the word and we can still take out of it. I pray for my sister, brothers and sisters. Go with each one of them during this work in Jesus' name. Amen.